My name is Papia DeBroy, and I serve as our lead on our insights and research work at Opportunity at Work. Um, I came to Opportunity at Work having spent many years in the corporate world working with executives in the Fortune 500. We spent a lot of time thinking about talent management strategies there, how to think about your workforce to optimize for what your business needed. Right? It's been really fascinating to come to Opportunity at Work now and start to bring the lens of the labor force to that understanding and also the lens of the worker. I'm really excited to share some of the insights from the report with you all today. Um, the team with Accenture, with Accenture has just been fantastic to work with, and I'm excited to share these findings. Before I do that, though, I actually want to kick us off with kind of a moment of inspiration that has really continued to inspire us at Opportunity at Work. It's time that we change the way that we define talent. <laughs> I'm LaShawna Lewis. I am CEO of Elton Lewis Consulting. I don't have a college degree, but I'm a computer geek. LaShawna grew up in East St. Louis. She had a passion for computers, but she wasn't able to get a college degree. And because she didn't have a college degree, she couldn't even get an interview for a tech job, despite her coding skills. So she was working as a bus driver. I've been working on computers since I can remember. But I always found myself in low-wage jobs. And then I always got pulled into doing jobs and duties that are mid to high salary range. So I was able to find a program called Launch Code to help me. And uh, from that, I ended up getting a full-time position at MasterCard, working as an engineer there. After MasterCard, I did start my own business, but at the same time, I got offered a position as a CTO of a startup and director of aerospace IT at a different startup. Not everyone has a four-year degree or can't afford a four-year degree, but everyone should have an opportunity. So maybe we need to look past the pedigree and look more at the skill base. And that's what the STARS movement drives home. STARS are skilled through alternative routes. There are millions of STARS like me just waiting to work and all they need is an opportunity. Let someone take the first step in changing your company or your organization into something that's more aligned to where the future is going to be. My name is Lashana Lewis, and I'm a STAR. Value potential over pedigree and join the STARS movement. We're so delighted Lashana could be here with us today. Um, we're going to turn the conversation over to her after we cover these insights and, and the rest of the panel. Um, I'm going to dive it's in. Oh, I'm going to dive into some of the content <laughs> that you'll find in the report today, and I want to share some of the um, some of the data that we found really exciting. Um, I was surprised, and I think most of us on the team were surprised, to learn that 74% of jobs created between 2008 and 2017 were jobs where employers typically require a four-year college degree. Now, many of you may not be surprised um, if you've been working in this space to know that more than 60% of individuals in our active labor force today do not have a college degree. So we had a situation where 60% of the workforce had access to only 26% of new jobs being created, right? So when you talk to employers, they're experiencing frustration, right? We can't find the workers we need for the jobs we need to fill. When you talk to workers, and we talked to dozens this fall, both in interviews and focus groups, they're also feeling deeply frustrated, right? They know they have the skills to do more than they're being given the opportunity to do in a lot of their jobs today, and they're not giving access to those jobs themselves, right? So that was actually a lot of the reason we started to do this work. Could we actually understand, of the population of workers who do not have a four-year degree today, do some of them have the skills that American businesses are looking for? This was the fun part, right? Designing how do we actually figure out if the workforce today that doesn't have a four-year degree actually does have the skills. Um, the team at Accenture was so fun to work with on this because we really um, were committed to using public data sets to do this work. It was important to us that all of our findings could be replicated by other researchers. So we pulled data from the census. We were pulling data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And the way we did this analysis was we looked at each worker. We understood what job that worker was in. 
And then based on the job, we understood from the Department of Labor and Bureau of Labor Statistics what skills are required of that job. And then one of the things we wanted to do was understand if someone has the skills required for that job, that is work experience that requires them to bring those skills to work. So let me talk you through this example you see on the page here. On the left-hand side, you see a list of skills that are associated with what is typically a low-wage job, a sales representative. That individual has to speak effectively, they have to be an active listener, they have to persuade, they have to have some level of social perceptiveness, and so on. Now, what was interesting to us is we wanted to understand, given the skills that are required of a sales rep, what other jobs exist in the economy today that also require similar skills. So we looked at more than 750 occupations in the US economy today, and we mapped them to each other occupation in the US economy to understand, are there skills overlaps in these pairings of occupations? And what we found was there's actually a lot more overlap than I think a lot of us realize. So what you see on the page here is an example of a pairing. So on the right-hand side, you see an advertising sales agent. This is typically a job that is a middle wage role, and it's actually one that requires the same skills. There's slight differences in the importance of that skill for that job, but it's actually one that not only you see um, similar skills aligned to, but you actually see some members of our US economy today making transitions towards. So we actually studied across all occupations what other pairings might exist, and given the, the wages of workers, could we actually start to predict some transitions for them to other jobs? It was fascinating to us to see that, in fact, a lot of low-wage workers have skills that are relevant for middle-wage jobs and high-wage jobs. So this concept that the wages you earn are actually indicative of the skills you have was false. To us, that was a deeply important finding, right? We, we frequently conflate the wages you earn with the skills you have. And to us, this provided evidence to suggest that that's false. One of the important things we do want to point out is certainly um, college is a very important pathway, right, for a lot of workers in the United States to acquire skills. This to us sh shared with us that work experience is also important. A lot of workers are gaining the skills they need through the work they're doing today. We wanted to situate this in this the um, broader, uh, the broader envelope of the actual US labor force. So I'm gonna talk you through some numbers here. Um, many of you know we have over 320 million individuals in our um, population today. About half of those individuals are not active in the workforce. So that's what you see on the left-hand side of the chart here. Um, included in that are children, retirees, and so on. On the right, on the left, yes, yeah, sorry. I'm trying to adjust for <laughs> the live stream. On the right-hand side of the chart here, you see the other half of the population, and these are members of the active US um, labor force today. Of the about 160 million individuals who are active in the labor force today, 60 million do have a college degree or some advanced degree. What we found was there are 71 million individuals who do not have a college degree, do have a high school diploma, and each one of them is in an occupation that requires skills, where the skills um, can be applied to a job that pays a higher wage in their local market. These are the individuals we're calling stars. They're skilled through alternative routes. They have learned skills on the job, and we believe there's a lot of value in the skills they're learning in that work. It was interesting to us to actually start to understand this population of 71 million workers um, a little bit more. Certainly we saw a lot of diversity within this pool. 50% of African Americans, 44% of Hispanics, 43% of non-Hispanic whites are stars in the US population today. But further, we found that stars actually are in all occupational categories in the US labor force today. Um, we see that 56% of veterans are stars. It really is a diverse pool of talent that encompasses the 71 million. Now, it's a big number, and we wanted to better understand how can we start to think about 
interventions that might support stars in their career pathways. And so we, um, we developed a segmentation that was based on someone's readiness to do higher wage work. So what you see here um, are three categories that we um, defined within the report. The first are shining stars. There are five million stars today in high wage jobs. These are individuals earning on average more than $77,000 a year. They are frequently in um, computer related jobs. They're also, uh, there are a lot of small business owners in this category as well. The next category that we define are a group we call rising stars. These are individuals who, based on the skills required of their current job, actually have the skills to do a significantly higher paid job than what they're doing today. On average, these workers could see an increase of 70% in their earnings based on just the skills they have today. Now, there are 30 million individuals in the US economy today that fit into this category, who have the skills to see transformative wage gains if they were given the opportunity and access to those jobs. Finally, the last category we define are a group we call forming stars. There are 36 million individuals in this category. And while many of them do have the skills to move to a higher wage role that pays at least 10% more than what they're earning today, for instance, a cab driver might um, be able to transition to a truck driver job, those transitions are not ones that would lead to transformative wage gains for this group. A lot of us in the workforce field are focused on forming stars today. Right? How can we help give them the skills they need to change the trajectory of their career path? There are a lot of implications to these findings. We're gonna talk a little bit more about them in the um, conversation on our panel in just a little bit, but we think it's important to point out that from Shining Stars, we actually have a lot to learn. Many of them face tremendous barriers to get to where they are today. A systematic study of what those barriers are would help us understand what we need to do to actually help them unleash their true potential. Further, I think many of them feel they could go even further if we were to remove barriers they, they are still facing in the labor market today. For rising stars, this is really a category of workers that we have not spent much time understanding um, as a researcher community, right? A lot of them have skills that um, American businesses are looking um, for today in their talent pipelines. What would it look like for us to improve access for them and actively build pipelines that include these stars? And finally, with forming stars, there's a, lot, um, there's a lot more work to be done in taking some of the models that have really innovated on how to train active members of the workforce today. What would it look like for us to take some of those learnings and really scale it to the, um, to the challenge, right? We have 36 million workers in this category. We detail a lot of calls to action in our report. For employers, we think it's important to continue to push on skills-based hiring. In addition to removing four-year degrees, what does it look like for employers to actively start to source this talent? The same way that a lot of employers go out and actively source from colleges and universities, what would it look like to bring the same level of deliberation to this talent pool? And finally, a lot of employers have stars on their teams. They know the power of this talent pool already. What does it look like to continue to invest in this group, right? To ensure that there are career pathways, that people are getting access to, to learn new skills and can continue to move up their, um, in their career path. For workforce development organizations, we found it a very compelling set of conversations in the fall with stars to actually hear their perspective on this term. A lot of them shared with us that they felt seen for the first time through this terminology. What would it look like for us as a field to actually adopt this language, really enable a whole new talent pool to um, achieve their potential in the labor market today? And finally, we'll talk a little bit about this later too. For analysts, for researchers, for policymakers, you know, this was a first step in understanding this population. We did it with imperfect data. What would it look like for us to actually get better data about this population, not just so that we can understand them better, but also to be able to target interventions to support them more effectively in their journeys?